what's up? In 1991, two things of great importance were released. Myself and a film from the acclaimed director of Quigley Down Under in Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. As well as the writer of Half Past Dead and Who's Your Caddy? A film by the name of Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Oh boy, what an absolute treasure this movie is. If you've never seen it, it's the tale of Harley Davidson, rough and tough and introspective bike mechanic and his best friend, the Marlboro Man, a tired cowboy living in the city. When Harley returns home to handle some business after being gone for two years, he learns that he has quite a bit more business than he anticipated. Before I continue, there will be spoilers for this three decade old movie. So if you haven't seen this movie and you're not looking for a fat white guy who recently turned 30 to read you his version of the synopsis, I suggest you take your business elsewhere. In learning of this movie, I was shocked to see that it was such a commercial flop, pulling in a lousy $7.4 million against this estimated $23 million budget. Now if you weren't alive in the 90s to enjoy the latest cinema, let me tell you, this is what people were into. Motorcycles. Cigarettes. Alcohol. Over-the-top action. Badass dudes and sexy women. And that's exactly what this movie is. Sure, there's a story, but the story is just a mostly cohesive slip and slide carrying you from motorcycle montage to exploding construction site, to the good guys sharing a drink because they finally won despite the fact that this movie is only halfway over, nothing could go wrong. Truthfully, I did not see this movie when it originally came out as I wasn't some sort of omnipotent baby. I only know this movie exists because in anticipation of the next season of Better Call Saul, I was thinking fondly of Giancarlo Esposito and perusing his filmography, stumbling across this gem. I mean, imagine my surprise when I find out this movie features a whole host of actors whose names you probably won't recognize, but I think you'll recognize their faces. People like Mickey Rourke as Harley Davidson, Don Johnson as the Marlboro Man, Big John Studd as Jack Daniel, Eloy Casado as Jose Cuervo, Chelsea Field as Virginia Slim, Daniel Baldwin as an inappropriate school shooter joke, Tom Sizemore as this emotionless business toddler, Branscombe Richmond as the big Indian guy, ooh, and of course Tia Carrera as the sexy lady for the bad guys and Vanessa Williams as the sexy lady for the good guys. I of course use the term good guys and bad guys very loosely, every character in this movie is a murderer. This movie starts off exactly how every action movie made in the 90s should. The main character is standing shirtless in a dimly lit room, smoking a cigarette. There's a sexy naked lady on his bed and you get to see her boobies. The radio is talking about a new drug for the kids of America called Crystal Dream and that's definitely not foreshadowing. Then boom, literally three and a half minutes of Mickey Rourke's Harley Davidson riding a motorcycle from Texas to California to the tune of Wanted Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi. For what purpose? Who knows? I just imagine someone at MGM screaming, I paid for the whole song, I'm gonna use the whole song! I thought this whole intro section was incredibly cliche the first time I watched it, and it is, but you'll soon find out that anything less than that would have been a disservice. When he eventually stops at a gas station to fill up his hog, he runs into a little bit of an armed robbery situation. But he then proceeds to whip the absolute dog shit out of both guys, one with a desert eagle and one with a knife, who says, I'm gonna cut you long, wide and deep, motor. Which was some out-of-pocket shit to say, so I'm glad he got bodied. Harley picks up the deagle and makes his way onwards. Next, we cut directly to another set of breasts, this time on a motorcycle. <laughs> nice. We also see that we're in a bar where Don Johnson's Marlboro Man is harassing Big Indian over a game of pool. Unfortunately for old Marlboro, Big Indian has a butterfly knife, and oh, he's, <laughs> he's actually going to stab Don Johnson to death while everyone just watches. Harley has even shown up by this point, and he just sits down and watches his best friend get slashed across the chest by The Rock's third cousin. Marlboro, scrambling to survive, snags a cue ball, which he uses to bonk Big Indian into submission. So Harley and Marlboro head out to their secret makeout spot in front of a billboard to have a heart-to-heart. It starts normal, two older guys who haven't seen each other in a couple of years, talking about women and work, but then Harley starts talking about God, and best I can tell, Harley Davidson only knows how to ride bike, punch bad guy, make quip, and eat can of bean. It's not that this type of character can't have depth, but I don't know if Harley is a philosopher. It's even more awkward, because his pondering sounds like my six-year-old nephew's thoughts on God. Next thing, they're off to their brand name, named people headquarters. <laughs> Good one. The Rock and Roll Bar and Grill. Outside, Hartley comments on how Marlboro is falling apart because of his shitty boots and his shitty bike. Marlboro makes his own semi-racist comment about his piece of shit motorcycle. You're right about this rice grinding horse. 
before Harley tries to shoot it. Barbro remarks about his terrible aim, and Harley hands him the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle as a gift. And then Marlboro absolutely just fucking massacres his motorcycle with it. As a quick aside, it is mentioned several times that this is the future. This movie was released in 1991, but it takes place in 1995. They also mention that Burbank has a fancy new airport. So they've now gone inside and Harley is staring at this woman on stage, Lulu Daniels, the good sexy lady and wife of big blonde, big John Studs, Jack Daniel. That's a tongue twister. Harley had a thing with Lulu once in the past, and thus Jack hates his guts. Upon being told Jack will kill him, Harley says this unforgettable line. It's better to be dead and cool than alive and uncool. Which is, <laughs> it's perfect. The first time we see Jack, it is in I shit you not an arm wrestling match, which he appears to win on accident after going into a fit of rage when he sees Harley. This is also where we meet Giancarlo's Jimmy Giles for the first time and just... <laughs> What a delightful man. Oh, hey, Jimmy. You want to help me out here a little? It's your world, Holmes. I'm just living in it. Immediately after, Jack and Harley get into a pretty fucking sick fight, ending with Jack throwing Harley through a window, after which Harley falls from the second story and collapses through the roof of a car. Then Jack leaps through the window, landing on Harley like it's a fucking anime fight scene, and then as Jack begins choking Harley to death, Harley reveals Lulu only ever loved Jack and their friendship recovers just like that. With that behind them, Jimmy jumps Jack over the arm wrestling match as he was supposed to take a dive. Harley and Marlboro learn that their lease on the rock and roll bar and grill runs out in 21 days and due to the new airport, the Great Trust Bank is demanding millions of dollars to renew. Of course, being besties, they resolve to get the money together for the new lease. Uh, their first plan, literally their first plan, uh, rob the Great Trust Bank. Rob them and then pay them with their own money. The alternatives? Backup plans? None. They're all pretty much just immediately on board because of course they are. These people breathe Terminator and bleed die hard. That being said, they do have a plan. And that plan may only work because they wrote in the script that it worked. But they have a plan. And it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, they create several traffic obstacles to force a transport truck filled with dollarinos to the appropriate location, where they then aggravate the drivers until they get out of the truck. Marlboro then shoots the gun out of one of the driver's hands and the belt off his waist, and then Harley throws his shotgun at the other guy and then tackles him, to which Marlboro says, Guns are made to be shot, Harley, not thrown. The rest of the crew blow the truck and get the goods. One of the drivers managed to hit the alarm button before everything went down, and just as the gang begins to vamoose, five greasy men in turtleneck trench coats arrive and begin shooting at them with sweaty loser bad guy guns. All the guns in this movie feel odd. Was this normal in the 90s? We've got several revolvers of unknown model, a Desert Eagle, several Stair Augs, MP5Ks, and oh shit, Jack Daniels here on his hog to save the day by popping the gas cap off of the tank and then sliding his bike into them just before pulling out a Zippo and lighting the gasoline trail on fire, blowing up the bad guy's black Buick. Classic. In the mayhem, the boys climb into the sewer to their getaway truck and just fucking peace, dickholes. At the airplane graveyard, oh yeah, there's an airplane graveyard and approximately half the movie was shot there, so don't be surprised when I mention it again. Jack immediately demands a new motorcycle, and also asks that they not let Lulu find out, resulting in... Hey look, I can take care of the bike, but I can't take care of the bitch. Before long, they realize they've jacked a truckload of imaginary meth. Crystal Dream. Back at Lex Luthor's headquarters, we finally get a good look at our villains. We got the Baldwin I always forget about, Daniel. Uh, he looks positively wet during this movie, like he spent his time between takes in the shower. We also have Tom Sizemore as CEO Chance Wilder. He looks and acts like his entire persona is based off of books on pickup artistry. Anyway, they're not interesting enough to talk about anymore. Uh, they're using the Great Trust Bank to run drugs and make money, and they're mad the drugs are gone. That's the gist of it. The boys have returned to the rock and roll. Lulu is still singing. I'm starting to think she's actually an animatronic because it never seems to end. Harley and Marlboro are vibing, probably just waiting on the plot to develop, when a waitress sits down and just... Um, the name tag's wrong. The real name's Honey. Pure gold. And it's sweet. 
Immediately after this gratuitous invitation, Harley explains how his wife left him in the middle of the night, and Marlboro consoles him, suggesting he get his dick wet and also let him borrow his motorcycle, uh, which Marlboro then uses to race a cop who, after a harrowing two-wheeled adventure, turns out to be his part-time lover and full-time police officer, Virginia Slim. Marlboro then proceeds to bang Virginia Slim, who tells him that she loves him, but she's getting married and that she doesn't want to see him anymore. And then they kiss some more and presumably also have sex some more. When they wake up in the morning, Harley has just mysteriously arrived and made breakfast for them. <laughs> just kidding, he sets the kitchen on fire and they go to a diner instead. Virginia uses her cop brain and cop knowledge in tandem to explain Crystal Dream to Harley. Uh, she says something about 100% effectiveness and death, I think. I'm not sure. I don't know how many times I've watched this scene at this point, but I get distracted by Harley's face every time. His mouth, it's just smattered with shit. It looks like he's been sucking on a stick of butter. Harley and Virginia head back to her place. Virginia leaves as Marlboro walks outside whilst taping his shitty boots together. Harley asks him about his boots, and Marlboro tells him, I off my boots, Harley. I'm in no fucking mood. He then steals Virginia's new man's hog and heads off with Harley to the Great Trust Bank, where they intend to trade the drugs they stole for the money they meant to steal. Here we get to see the bad sexy lady, Tia Carrera, who you might remember from Wayne's World, Schwing! She takes them upstairs where they go to a room to talk to Chance Wilder, the CEO of Great Trust Bank, but they, they don't go to Chance's room. They go to a different room and then they talk to Chance on the phone. Uh, Marlboro bets Harley a dollar that it ain't gonna work out. Chance calls them and starts talking about balls. You know something? You've got balls, big ones, but they are not as big as you might think. And then Harley starts talking about balls. My balls are big enough to get your attention. But eventually that stops, and Harley tells him that the drugs will cost him two and a half million dollars, before changing it to two and a half million dollars plus one dollar due to the side bet. And he'll meet them at the plane graveyard, ending the call by calling Chance an asshole. The deal seems to go off without a hitch, and the boys return to the rock and roll bar and grill when the trench coat commandos arrive. I hate these fucking trench coats, and I hate Daniel Baldwin's slicked back hair. These people look like butt plugs made from recycled trash bags. The goons do some posturing to old man Giles while the rest of the crew watch from behind a one-way mirror. Sensing that it was a one-way mirror with the boys in the back, Chief Goon Daniel Baldwin murders old man Giles and then turns his guns on the mirror, shattering it and killing Jimmy Giles. In the ensuing gunfight, Jose Cuervo guns down one of the men, but dies doing it. Marlboro and Harley take the money and jump through the previously broken window onto the roof of a car to escape. Jack Daniel takes down another bad guy, but is shot before he can escape. Jack Daniel, Old Man Giles, Jimmy Giles, and Jose Cuervo are all dead. Okay, so, so far, Harley and Marlboro have resolved to help their old friends get the money to save the bar. Good news, they have the money. Bad news, they no longer have friends or a bar. Marlboro and Harley flee to the airport where they hide in the luggage compartment of a plane. Harley has to wrestle one of the employees loading luggage after she finds them, but she calms down after experienced cuckold Daniel Baldwin kills her co-worker. The three of them then get locked into the plane and fly to Vegas, where they, surprise, learn there's a tracking device in the case. This leads to, by far, one of the craziest things that happens in this movie. Harley and Marlboro's room is basically on the top floor. The goons arrive and chase them onto the roof, where to escape, they have to jump into a pool. Not a diving pool, not an Olympic swimming pool, just a regular ass hotel pool. From like a hundred floors up, they jump into the pool and just casually climb out of the pool and escape on a train. On the train, Marlboro tells Harley it's not over, and they have to go back to avenge their friends. Harley tells them their friends are already dead and he'd rather not join them. And now that the tracker is disabled, they can split the money and go their separate ways. Marlboro says again that it's not right before hitting him with the old... Better to be dead and cool than alive and uncool. And jumping off of the train. I wanted to hate this callback. I wanted to make fun of Marlboro for eating 100% Kentucky Fried shit. But Marlboro shoving that dumb line back in Harley's face is just too satisfying. They separate for a moment where Marlboro visits Virginia and thanks her for her positive impact on his life before Harley shows up on his Harley and they ride away. 
They return to the airplane graveyard where they sit together again and Marlboro finally tells Harley that he keeps these same shitty duct tape boots because of the first and last gift his father ever gave him. Harley tells him that before three weeks ago, he had never shot at a person before because he doesn't want to hurt anybody. Harley then activates the tracker, beginning their plan for revenge. In the Great Trust Bank's private helicopter, we see criminal deviant Daniel Baldwin tell the pilot to shut the fuck up, which is just rude. The remaining three henchmen arrive at the graveyard and find the briefcase in one of the plane bodies, but all that's inside is the coin. Then D Daniel Baldwin does this. Harley once again talks to God through the words of an elementary school student before Marlboro gives them some last minute shooting tips. In the gunfight, Marlboro absolutely just fucks up one of the guys while Harley fires wildly into the air. The trash bag mafia applies pressure and get Harley and Marlboro on the run and it has got everything. Slow motion jumps, tandem reloads, walking forward ominously while the good guys are in a full sprint. At one point, a rabbit bumps a can and they just fucking allowing Marlboro to blast another one, leaving one lone trench coat. The boss goon, habitually greasy Daniel Baldwin, gets the better of Harley and Marlboro, wounding Marlboro and leading Harley to say the best line of the entire film. Fuck shit, piss! Fuck shit in the pair's ass! Full-grown toddler Daniel Baldwin eventually takes Marlboro hostage, leaving it up to Harley to take him out. Harley immediately, and I mean immediately, shoots Marlboro in the shoulder before Marlboro tells him not to think leading Harley to close his eyes and fire wildly, hitting virgin ghost Daniel Baldwin in the hand, disarming him. Marlboro and Harley then both begin wildly firing for about 10 seconds, hitting Daniel repeatedly, finally ending my nightmare of having to look at Daniel Baldwin. Harley and Marlboro then take the money and bribe the helicopter pilot to fly them back to the Great Trust Bank Tower so they can finish the job. Here we also see <laughs> Chance speaking Japanese. Marlboro begins a confrontation by shooting Chance's phone while he's speaking. Harley offers to return the money in exchange for keeping the rock and roll bar and grill, and Chance tells him to suck pipe and kill him if they're gonna. When Marlboro claims he can't kill an unarmed man, Harley throws his empty gun to Chance. Before their argument can continue, several armed guards storm into the office. Just before they're to be executed, their ex-Grand Trust Bank pilot friend descends from the skies and reveals that this bank's private helicopter has a hidden machine gun, which is then used to turn every unnamed character in the room into paste. Marlboro, somehow, still feels weird about killing Chance, but Chance just can't shut the fuck up. Rather than shoot him, Marlboro throws his gun at him, nearly knocking him out the window, now shattered. Chance attempts to shoot Marlboro while falling, and as Marlboro attempts to kick the gun out of his hand, Chance grabs a hold of his shitty boots, taking Marlboro with him out the window. Harley grabs Marlboro's arm just in time to catch him, and before long, Marlboro's daddy's dusty old shoes disintegrate, and Chance Wilder goes the way of Hans Gruber. Harley brings up a callback of his own. Hey, guns are made to be shot. That throne. In the end, Marlboro ends up at a rodeo and Harley picks up a sexy hitchhiker and rides off into the sunset. And everyone lives happily ever after. Except for, you know, Old Man Giles, Jimmy Giles, Jack Daniel, Lulu Daniel, Jose Cuervo, Chance Wilder, and Molded Sour Cream Man, Daniel Baldwin. I, uh, I love this movie. Uh, it may even be one of my favorite movies. If you like cheesy action movies and you've never seen this one, I really think you should. I was very skeptical and expected to hate this movie, so I understand if upon watching you find that tacky callbacks come across as shallow world building, but after time, I found them fun and thoughtful. I loved how, because Harley had to take a cab, he mentions to Marlboro that he'll need an IOU should he lose their $1 bet. It felt like the squad mate dialogue in open world video games. And the movie kind of rewards you for paying attention to all those random throwaway lines, as those lines aren't just useless small talk. They're either setting up for a callback, or they are necessary exposition. Uh, without which, the plot is absolute nonsense. Hell, those lines mentioning the new airport in Burbank are basically the first breadcrumbs of where the story is headed. And for all the odd little stories it creates along the way, this movie leaves you hanging on very little. Like, I'm curious what happened to poor Lulu in the bar, but beyond that, I know what happened. They either rode off into the sunset, or they fucking died. Oh, also, uh, Marlboro's real name in the movie is Robert. He's just called the Marlboro Man, but it's not his name. Uh, all the others are their actual names, though. Um, I think that's it. I give it a very firm 7.5 out of 10 for pure enjoyment alone. 
And while the story is very abstract, I do love the way they make all the little pieces fit together. Uh, thank you for watching. It was very cool of you. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you liked it. If you want to see more, consider subscribing, and maybe I'll do something like this again in the future. Uh, once again, in the immortal words of Don Cheadle, Peace, dickholes. Dick